Okay, so Jonathan Pajot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm not going to introduce you because anyone that's anyone that is here is here for you. And you also noticed recently that it's kind of silly to introduce you as an icon carver <laughs> still. <laughs> I think it's hilarious. I, I really actually enjoy it, especially when like Jordan Peterson introduces me as a Russian Orthodox icon cover, which is just great. It's funny. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and it, it is more and more visible with each interview that you're having recently, recently that, okay, icon covers don't talk about those things or don't talk about like It's that. mostly that I think it's, I think it's just strange. People don't understand how to, how to frame me. They don't understand what category to place me in and so they struggle they have to give me a qualifier and then they struggle to do that right. um so i i think it's just part of parcel of what i'm doing you know I'm, I'm trying to kind of span a lot of categories in what i'm doing so so i think that's what that's what happens when you try to do that but you also studied some theology right uh, yes i did yeah i studied theology both uh in university and on my own i don't have a degree or anything but i did study in uh, there's an Orthodox program here um, in Montreal, so I studied I studied for a few years in that program. So I have some formal some formal theological education, but a lot, most of what I know is just from my own reading and from my own uh, yeah. Sure, but it, but it's not just you. It's like Mathieu is a very curious guy. Then we re recently learned about Dan. <laughs> How many? Yeah, of my you third are there? brother. <laughs> Yeah, three, though there are three Peugeot brothers. And so, so yeah, so Mathieu is more, he is definitely more like a mathematician. He studied computer science uh, in school. And, but and the hermit, also, right? <laughs> yes, he's more hermit like, you know, that's <laughs> more his personality. And he, but he, him also, I would say most of his understanding and knowledge comes from his own studies and not from the formal, uh, formal world of academics. We both became very disillusioned. Mathieu actually, Mathieu actually uh, quit university. I think he had like one or two classes left before he got his degree. And he almost did it on purpose because he, he was so annoyed with the academic world that he quit just before having his degree, uh, just to, to almost to be able to say that he doesn't have a degree in anything. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, maybe, maybe it's a question to your parents actually not necessarily you because i i have four little boys myself and i wonder how to how to raise them so that each of them like follow their own path but at the same time is so successful as you three are because dan also was like a popular guy in canada yeah my years, brother right? my brother dan was a professional skateboarder at some point he was one of the top he was like in the top seven or ten like top ten in the world for a few wow. years uh just super very technical, very proficient. And so he's he's actually now a, a Pentecostal type pastor in Vancouver awesome. and he just opened a, uh, a skate park there. So we're quite like, we're all the, all three of us, we both, we are, th the three of us are quite different in some ways, but then also in other ways, we're pretty, we're very similar. Like our father is someone who wasn't afraid to just blaze his, his own path, like didn't feel, the need to get um, the uh, let's say the 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 acknowledgement of others necessarily like it, it's like it, he just did his thing and he did it you know completely and so I think that we we all three of us got that you know we we never felt like we needed to have uh, official titles or official this or official that we just did what we did with all our all our heart really low low in agreeableness not necessarily. To fit in. <laughs> oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. My tears is low in agreeableness. My father, too. I'm higher in agreeableness, yeah. I would say. And, uh, and Dan, I'm not sure. I think he's probably pretty high in agreeableness, too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, before we move to, to the symbolic stuff, I wanted to ask you about the, the missionary work that you did. Because I get you, you say a word or two about it here and there, but we never got like a a whole idea what what it was like and and what 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 did you do there and you were still a uh, Protestant so, there right then right I know I was Orthodox I was already Orthodox, Orthodox but okay. I was it was a it's one of those things like don't ever do this people uh, mm -hmm. so because what happened is I was I was going through this crisis I would say a general crisis which was not 
not just a crisis uh, in terms of art and there was a spiritual crisis, but I was also working a job which, you know, although I, I appreciated the work and I appreciated the job, I always felt like there was something missing or that I was, that it was just not, it, it wasn't particularly uh, useful to be doing what I was doing. I was working for a project management company and developing, uh, developing uh, pedagogical material and, and writing case studies and doing animations and doing all this stuff kind of like to support their trainings so so that's what I was doing I was doing that I guess like from 1999 to 2000 1998 to 2003 maybe so about five years um anyways so in that moment like I was I was just thinking like this is not what I want to do long term and so with my wife we had looked at going to um to do some volunteer work with a Christian organization um which was called MCC, Mennonite Central Committee. But I converted to Orthodoxy in 2003, and then everything came together in 2003 to leave. And so I basically converted in like on, at Pascha and left in the fall, oh, which wow. was just, okay. seriously, never do that. That's like the worst <laughs> thing you can do because I was basically a new convert and I was just kind of thrown out into the world. And there in Congo where we were, I was able to, it took forever. I was able to finally find a parish, but it's really hard to access it and it was difficult because of the cultural difference you know I, it's like all imagine all this cultural difference you just become orthodox and then you move to africa and then you go to an Af to an orthodox church in africa so it was really intense and difficult but oh, wow. there are some very powerful shining moments of my time in congo in terms of orthodoxy um that were that were pretty powerful um anyway so while we were there what we were doing was working with artisans Mm -hmm. The uh, MCC, Mennonite Central Committee, they started a project called 10,000 Villages, which, is, which was a series of stores all over North America that sold, uh, let's say, handmade things from all over, from all over the world with, with kind of fair trade ideas, like ideas of encouraging local economies, encourage local know-how, and also preserve more traditional ways of making things. So that's who I was working with in Congo. We, we, we basically teamed up with a group, we basically created a network of artisans. And uh, because export was so difficult to do in Congo, what we did is we opened a local store and then use a local store to kind of train the artisans in terms of uh, in terms of quality, in terms of design, in terms of also how to present yourself to clients and all that. Because it's hard, you know, when people are, are poor and are, don't have a lot of education, they don't, they, it's like they need a bridge, right? To be able to interact with people that are more highly educated and have more means. And so we were kind of acting as that bridge between the market and the artisans. And we did that for four years in Congo. We opened the store. Uh, we had about working with like at least 30 different artisans and artisan groups. Um, and when we, so what we did is we set it up in a way with a local partner and we trained that person and ultimately the last year, like the, 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 the fourth year, we, we moved out of the management of the project, became like consultants, and the project just ran for that year with the local person. And so that store remained open until COVID. Like it, it, so that was like 15 oh, nice. years. Or whatever. So oh, it, was wow. a pretty, it was a pretty powerful project, especially mm -hmm. knowing that in Congo, most projects just don't, they just don't, they, they, they fizzle sure, because sure. People, yeah. Congo is a crazy chaotic place. Um, yeah. But sadly, the store is in, is in trouble because of COVID. You know, it's just they don't have he didn't have a lot of safety net. And so I've been in contact with our friend there. His name is Debo. And uh, he's really struggling. So we're, so hopefully, like, there'll be some opportunities for him soon because it's, it's, it's tough. It's tough. We have at least we have social nets that kind of help us out of these moments. But COVID in Africa, like in Kinshasa, was just insane. It's it's. They, they had lockdowns. Can you imagine lockdowns in, in, in Kinshasa? Africa. Like my friend <laughs> called me and he said, he said, we have these lockdowns. The police are finding us. We have to wear a mask and all this stupid stuff. And then he said, oh, I, it's like, I'm just, I just have a bit of typhoid. Right? Okay. It's like there's diseases everywhere in Congo. Like people get typhoid, they get malaria. But it's important they get you don't get COVID, right? <laughs> and it's like, okay, as long as you don't get, it's like COVID right. is nothing compared to these diseases. So it's just really, it was just so absurd. Anyways, Gosh. so that tells you, it gives you an idea of what we were doing in Africa. Okay, so, so, so what was seven it? Years. Seven Four years. Four years in Congo and three years in Kenya. Oh, wow. 
was there a, like a spiritual element to it in any way evangelization it, it no not at all no not, not in that. terms of the not in terms of uh, because i wasn't a mennonite you know so we didn't have official evangelization as part of the the program it was really more in terms of a craft but there was always there's there's always like a secondary evangelization that is you know you 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 work with people you know you you learn from people and you become like a testimony but to be honest the idea of sending missionaries to evangelize africans is the silliest thing in the world it's like they should be sending missionaries to evangelize us because they're way more christian than we are and so to me the idea of going to africa to evangelize africans is just a it's just not a just not something that holds up it's it's more to to kind of help them to give them potential to do the projects they want to do you know so that that's what we were doing it's actually it's actually happening already in poland we have a very famous ugandan priest that goes around and, and gives retreats so you know <laughs> it's happening but um in terms of like the, the Orthodox Church is not necessarily known for uh, sending people out into those remote areas, right? Is, is, that, well, is there a reason? They will, it? but it's different. Yeah, it's okay. a different way of evangelizing. Orthodox, the way the Orthodox will often do it is, is, is that, for example, there, there was an Orthodox mission in Congo, which was pretty successful. Uh, it was more in the interior than in Kinshasa. And the way they did it is, I mean, they basically send a monk. A monk goes out there, sets himself up, builds a hermitage, you know, mm -hmm. builds a chapel, starts okay. doing his thing, and then attracts curiosity and ultimately right. admiration. And then people yeah. start to to kind of congregate around that monk. That's that mm -hmm. seems to be the way that it was done also in Alaska, in the different places where the uh, where the, the the Orthodox had a, a major impact. That seems it's a it's more that way than through colonization. Mm -hmm. But that, that's like particularly like the Russian church or the or the uh, yeah both the Russians and the Greeks. So the Russians the are the ones who evangelize Alaska, okay. for example, and okay. they were very well received by the by the local people there because of because they didn't they didn't come with also a lot of the colonization and the evangelization mm -hmm. was done with like the military on one side sure. and then the evangelization on yeah, the other, yeah. and so it's very shady. Whereas in yeah. Alaska, it was more of a just someone, you know, saints who would go there and and uh, and just live with the people. And so that's what happened in Congo. There's a there was I forget his name, which is horrible. In Congo was a Greek. Uh, it was a Greek monk who okay. went to the interior of Congo and set set himself up there. And um, he had a massive effect. I saw some of the churches um, involved with him. That's one actually one of my little magical moments of orthodoxy in Congo is one year. One year I was in the interior when Pascha was coming around. And so I was away from my, my, my wife for several weeks, kind of in a small, in a small area inside and in, kind of in the, in the Congolese jungle, I guess. And so it wasn't totally in the jungle, it's a city, but it's really, it's more remote. And so uh, Pascha was coming around. I was, in, I was doing my fast for the whole, for a Holy week. And so I was, I was like, what do I do? Like, I won't, I won't be anywhere for Pascha. It's not going to work out. So I start asking around and I start asking people, do you know about, do you know, what the, do you know about an Orthodox church and asking the Congolese around me? And a lot of people were like, I don't know what that is. And then there was one guy who said, I think I've heard of what you're talking about this Orthodox church. And he was really fascinating because the man, he was severely handicapped. He was, a, he was, his, he, his legs didn't work very well. And so kind of had to drag himself on the ground with his hands and his feet. And, um, but despite that, he was like a serious badass. This guy was tough as nails. I mean, a lot of the people that are handicapped that I met in Congo are super tough. They almost have to be, right? Because it's like they have to compensate for their physical lack. So he was super tough. And he's like, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set it up for you. I'll, I'll figure it out. And so he basically sets it up. He finds... He says there's a church. I know where it is. He finds where the church is. He sets up this taxi to like bring me to the church on uh, on Saturday in the afternoon. So nice. I get on this taxi. The taxi breaks down in the middle of nowhere. And so we get out of the taxi and he's with me. Right. So he's like, well, there's another road down there. So we like get to the other road. And yeah. this guy's like crawling on his hands and on his hands and, and legs. At this point, we get to the other street. He flags down a car. 
And uh, I'm not even sure it was a taxi at this point. And he's like, can we pay you to bring this guy to this place? And so anyway, so I get taken to this, to this church, like through yeah. this whole chaotic thing. And I arrive at this church and it's like a church from Thessaloniki that's like dropped in the middle of like Congolese forest. It's amazing. And so there's this church there and it's Saturday afternoon. And I'm like walking around and, you know, there are no white people there. There's no, there are no Europeans there. It's just, it's just Congolese people. And so everybody's like, what is this guy doing here? Like, what is happening? And so I walk into the church and it has frescoes. It's beautiful. Um, and then people start to kind of stream in from everywhere. They kind of just start to stream in for the, for the Paschal service. And I'm thinking, you know, it's like, I, I haven't struggled. I struggled to go to church and you know, I, for all of Holy week, I was in, I was there and I'm like, I need to go to confession, you know, before Pascha. So I'm like trying to figure it out. And I see this line forming for, for the priest. I'm like, okay, this, this, there are people who are going to confession. So I get in line with everybody to go to confession. And it's like, I come to this, to this African priest and it's like, I do my confession and I, oh, the whole time I'm thinking like, what is he going to like, how is he going to react? And he has the best reaction in the world. He looks at me after I go, I confess. And he says, you know, we're not pagans anymore. So we really have to live like Christians. And I'm like, what did I say? Like, what is the thing? Which, what, what did I say that it's like, here's this African priest telling me to stop being a pagan. Anyways, it was pretty Oh, amazing. you pagan. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty amazing. So, uh, so I was able to commune uh, that, that night and uh, spend the wow. night with the people and you know, it was really Greek, Greek chanting and everything. But then when they said Christ is risen, you know, at the mm-hmm. moment of the resurrection, then Africa started to like appear. People started to, to ululate, you know, when you hear women going, oh, they started yeah, yeah, to like yeah, yeah. To, to, to be more uh, boisterous. So it was wonderful. So I had, so I had a few moments like that of uh, okay. like amazing contact with orthodoxy in Africa. <laughs> wow. Well, I certainly wouldn't expect that to happen there. Interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you can't you can't know what to expect, especially in Congo. Yeah. Everything's possible. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> so thank you for that. But let's move on to. Yeah, let's move on to something else. <laughs> so, okay. So the uh, the the moment that I think I, I I got what you what you meant was was the Moana video, right? So where where you you brilliantly showed that okay, so we have those images but they present this deeper reality that tell us something about our current situation the, 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 the like like the mechanics of the of the of the current world surface in 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 that movie and then we can see that right and yeah. and, and especially shocking was was the scene with the with the pile of, of those flat stones and then the shell on the on the top right yeah that was so clear it was i mean if if you doubt my interpretation <laughs> up to that point when you see that that pillar with like a with a with this shell on top it's pretty clear yeah yeah it was it was definitely like the the definition of of, of this moment right <laughs> kind of yeah but then i i checked the comment section right in, in under that video and there was someone talking about how the shell can actually be the you know the the rainbow over the mountain or, or that it can be the the, the crown up the crown yeah, yeah. that's right yeah that's then, the thing that that's what makes it all very ambiguous and strange is that in a way maybe that's what's happening ultimately in this moment but you know it does can i say this it's that, that maybe that's what's happening but it's also there's a scandalous aspect to it it seems to happen through scandal mm-hmm. but so it's like we don't excuse the scandal even though okay. it might be ultimately revealing some little hint about how all the things come together at the end yeah so, so would that be okay to say that? So the patterns there, we have we have the pillar and we have this this let's say the crown, but then the interpretation is something else. Like if it's like a positive finishing up of, of the hierarchy, like the decoration, or if it's like the I don't know the the harbinger of breakdown soon. It's, it's well, the, the thing is that it, in a way, so especially in Moana, it's. What you have in people with people in Disney and a lot of this is that they have a very, very actually profound and intuitive understanding of these symbolic structures, but they are weaponizing them. Mm-hmm. And so that's the problem. And so often that's what some people point out to me. They'll say like, there's this, this aspect, which is seems to be true or seems to be pointing to something true. And often they're right. So for example, that image is very powerful, mm-hmm. but in, 
in the story, it's represented as a kind of replacement scheme. Okay. You know, yeah. because it ends with, you know, let's say it ends with, with Maui being completely left out of the equation. And then this, you know, the, the having Moana, let's say, solve the problem of the goddess and all this, like it's a, this, these two women encountering each other ends up being the solution to the problem. And so it shortcuts the usual masculine feminine relationship, which, call, which brings about, uh, that's like the birth of a, of a, of a new world. So, so the image, for example, the image, so the image of the pillar is, you're right, that it has, there's something of it that can actually reveal a high mystery about reality, but then it ends up being weaponized. Okay, so. so you, but you see that all the time that, like I said, a lot of the people, even, even some of the wokest, the wokest of the woke, they, they, they have a very deep intuition about these patterns mm -hmm. and they're using them. Mm -hmm. And that's why Christians and that's, a, that's a why Christians and people who don't want to be completely take over, taken over by this thing have to be able to, to understand it. It's the same with the rainbow symbolism. You're right. That, 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 you know, the current ruling uh, party that, that, that is ruling in terms of culture narrative, they're using the rainbow in a way that is completely symbolically right. Like it's not, it's a, it's a perfect understanding of the rainbow. It's just weaponized in one direction. And therefore, it becomes a problem because, yeah, because it it uh, it is it's almost like a devouring. It's using the ornament to devour the image. As you can imagine, right. the idea like of the pillar and the of and the crown. It's like this crown is trying to eat the the world. Mm -hmm. It's it's trying okay. to devour the the normal. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So, it, like from the technical perspective. When, on, when interpreting like a work of art, like a movie or, or, or animation of sorts, you get the full idea of what this pillar with this shell means in, in the light of the following scenes, not, not, not in itself, like in, in, in isolation, right? Yeah, so it's, it, you always have to interpret the patterns as all together. Like, mm -hmm. And that's, I think, I always tell people when you're interpreting a movie, for example, you have to stay inside the movie as long as possible. Because people tend to right away see something and say, oh, that's an image of Prometheus, you know, and then they then they jump out of the movie to now make these analogies. But it's like, wait, before you do that, why is that image of Prometheus used among all the other images that are there? You need to get that first before you tell me about something else. And so I always, that's my, always my recommendation is for people to let the story, the story tell you what its relationships are. So like it, this happened again with this happened, for example, in the Green Knight uh, uh, movie where people would take certain aspects of the Green Knight story mm -hmm. and then they would say, oh, this is very, this is good. Like this is a powerful image of some powerful image, but like, okay, yeah, but you have to be able to account for all these patterns working together in order to really see what it's about and not mm -hmm. just isolate one. And it's the same, so it ends up being the same with scripture. Right. Ultimately, with scripture, you have to kind of get to the basic pattern mm -hmm. before you take a verse and you just say, and you just kind of put it out there. You know, a lot of a lot of modern Christians, that's what they do. They just take a verse and put it out, and then it looks like it means something. But it's you always have to have it in balance with all the other stuff going on. Okay, so so you uh, teaching all of us the, the, to to think symbolically. Like the symbolic way of thinking is a kind of apologetics, right? I mean, maybe. I mean, I think you could see it that way. Apologetics in the sense that it's, a, it's at least proving, let's say, proving the case that the, the, the patterns that are in scripture yeah. are yeah. useful for you to, okay. as, a, as a lens, to see the world. And so it can open people up to, to wanting to explore them more, you know. Okay, so th do you think there is there could be a danger in that, in, in like like you had with with the Green Knight, like people interpreting just things taken out taken out of context, maybe, and maybe you, you can do the same thing with with the scripture, right? And when you interpret, oh yeah, for sure, <laughs> yeah, people do it all the time with scripture. It happens sure. all the time. You know, the word heresy, the word heresy means choice. Like that's what it refers to. It's like a, a heretic is someone who takes an aspect of it, of something mm -hmm. and then takes it to the exclusion of the others. 
And so you can you can you can use an aspect of scripture to create complete uh, you know aberrant things like things that aren't that are completely wrong if you isolate them from everything else. And and symbolic thinking does not protect us fully from that, or does it? Um, well, it if you tr if you do it properly, it'll help because what you want to do is you always want to be able to perceive the different aspects of each part, you know. And so there's also like in, there's always, especially like in Old Testament stories, I I always tell people, you know, each character has several sides to them and so let's say you know um let's say jacob represents something in a, in a pattern but jacob has a light side and a dark side you mm -hmm. can see you can see the story from the, the perspective cheater, from different yeah. perspectives and see the effect from different perspectives so that helps to that helps to kind of balance things out um and so but there there are totally have been moments where people have pointed out to me i think that i'm that I missed some aspect. Like for example, in the Moana video, there are people that have said, well, you know, maybe you could see it this way. And I'm like, oh, you know what? That there's there's even though I do think that that's what Disney was doing, what I mm -hmm. what I my basic sure, interpretation. Sure. But sometimes you can miss some aspects if you're too focused on that. Well, especially in the light of all the other movies they were making, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like if you see it, if you see all these movies getting put out with all the same thing, you know, you can try to isolate one and say this one isn't as bad, but it's like it's it's really happening in a way that's almost impossible to. I mean, if you look at what's going on now, it's just crazy. Like it's it's accelerating to levels that is just so caricatural and absurd. You know, like DC Comics, I think it's like almost every one of their characters now is like some LGBT character. So yeah. It's like you know, Wonder Woman is 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 bisexual, Robin is bisexual, uh, Superman is bisexual, everybody is is one kind of, and it, that's just the first step because the bisexual one is the most, like the easiest one to swallow because it, it, it says, oh, he still likes, but he's also, you know, and then, then it's just gonna keep going. It's gonna get yeah. weirder and crazier and more insane. Yeah, recently, I mean, like a couple of days ago, I, I showed your, uh, propaganda in pop culture video to to my local priest and he was like he, his eyes were like <laughs> became so big and 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 yeah he, he said that, oh that's that's just peterson on on steroids <laughs> so. what did you mean peterson on steroids yeah yeah because because there's this saying around our part of of youtube that that peterson is is the entry drug to pajot right <laughs> so. okay <laughs> So yeah, yeah. The, 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 when you notice those patterns in, in 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 several movies across like the across the whole spectrum of movies, then it's like so obvious that that you just cannot simply deny it, right? Um, I have a I have a question because I I had this I had this problem recently analyzing Waters Above in 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 one of the animes, and because because you talked a few times about Waters Above already, but I don't know because when 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 the when the mountain is is like you know putting us in the direction to the to putting us up like we're looking up and then above us is also water it's it's usually as you say it's usually a, a water of blessing but then in that particular anime and maybe that was just one scene or maybe the japanese culture is somehow disconnected from 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 this way of thinking and and it's it just doesn't work there there are monsters as well like the whales and yeah, there are dragons. monsters up there okay oh, so but they, they're, even in western i mean you know the story of jack and the beanstalk uh -huh. that's the story of jack and the beanstalk has the same yeah yes so you go up you go up the the ladder mm -hmm. and then you encounter giants in the heavens so, <laughs> so why right so, right so the question is like we are kind of the, the hierarchy is built to to somehow escape from the the flood that is below or the, the, the waters below but then it moves upwards toward like waters as well <laughs> is this is this the way to move <laughs> well like in terms of the monsters above you have to understand them as um you have to understand it fract like as a fractal mm -hmm. so in the same way that in the same way that when you let's say you go into the temple you will encounter a cherub 
at the at the door of the Holy of Holies. Or if you're going toward Eden, before you get to Eden, you'll encounter a monster mm -hmm. at the gate of Eden. Right. So the gate of Eden is higher than you, right? It's it's already above you. Mm -hmm. So there, there are traditions, for example, that talk about how the dog-headed men are both like monsters from the edge of the world, but they are also guardians of guardians of Eden. So all of this is related. It's the idea that it's like, if you're in a world, right? So imagine you're in, in any world. Mm -hmm. So the world has a lower part and the world has a higher part, yeah. right? a part that gives itself to something above. Now, mm -hmm. if you move down, you'll, you'll encounter monsters. You'll encounter Cerberus. You'll encounter, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of tonic monsters, these earth monsters, you know, whatever it is that you, the freaks, the Amazons, all of this is at the, it's at the lower level. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, not, and the demons and all that stuff you see in Western your uh, imagery, the demons are underground, right. And they're mixtures of all these kind of creatures. But if you go up, right, you encounter angels, angels are monsters too. I don't know what to tell you. They're men with wings. They, they're hybrids. They, they, but they, but right. it's not the same. It's a different, mm -hmm. it's a, you different have to monster. be careful, right. Yeah. Not to, not to, um, mix them up not to confuse them because one of them is like a guardian for a higher level mm -hmm. the other one is let's say the the let's say um you could say that it in a way might act as a guardian for an even lower level so mm -hmm. cerberus is a good example yeah, yeah. So cerberus stops people down here mm -hmm. from coming up but he also yeah. acts as an image of hades for that person that's coming this way right so it's like if you're coming this way you could be eaten by cerberus mm -hmm. Okay. Cerberus is preventing these things from coming up. So you can under, you can always understand it that way. So when you're going up, then you'll also encounter uh, a guardian. And then mm -hmm. that guardian will stop you from going up. Mm -hmm. But it'll be like the lower aspect of the higher world is the best way okay. to understand it. Okay. Uh, so you could see it as a support, right? So for example, so the cherub guards you from, it's not necessarily a monster that eats you. It could also be just potential. So mm -hmm. like a, a monster, um, the cherub acts as a guardian to the Garden of Eden. But the cherub is also the mount of Yahweh. Mm -hmm. right? Yahweh rides the cherub across the heavens. So you see that in the Psalms. Right? So he's the potential. He's the throne. right? The, he, he guards the throne of God. And the throne itself, like the reason why some angels are called thrones, is not yeah. arbitrary. right? They're the lower aspect of what is above us. So they function in a similar way as the throne that would be below and would have like, you know, imagine a throne with like, you know, uh, like lion feet, like you see in a lot of these thrones, like that's, that's what a throne is. A throne is potential that, that, that seats your authority. You sit, you, you establish your authority on your throne. And so it becomes an image of your kingdom, you could say. So the throne is potential and then the crown is potential, right? Uh, like the but it's different. It's the it's crown is, is glory. The crown, okay. the crown is glory. But and they're related. They're, they're related right. together, but they're yeah. not the same. It's, and, and you could say that um, you could say that metaphysically, ultimately in God, they're the same, mm -hmm. but not in the world. And you have to be careful not to confuse them because that's you could say that that's the trick, right? That's happening now. One of the tricks that's happening now is to confuse the lower waters with the higher waters mm -hmm. and to try to try to change, try to kind of switch one for the other. Right. And so you have an intuition, right? Yeah. That let's say the crown is the highest. Yeah. 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 And so so then what 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 the world is trying to do now is to put the monster up there yeah. as the crown in but the lower right. monster. Yes. So that's yes, what's that's going on. Like it, it, it's that's, that's why the, the yeah. highest god right now is is you know intersectional monster okay so that's the flip that's what we and, worship and that's the flood at the same time because the 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 the, the, uh, the above and the below are mixed right so exactly so so you could say that it's an image of the flood because that's yeah. exactly what happens during the flood the waters from below come up the waters from above come down they mix the, they mix together and then yeah. the world ceases to exist okay Okay. That's why a lot of this stuff is like is is basically is destroying the world. It's destroying yeah. the categories. And is this is this war always going on? Like 
do the margins always attack the center or, or does the center always ex try to expand to, 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 to get the margins or do we have a stability at times or is this always like, is, this always, is there always this turmoil? I think I think that it, there's always a tension, but I don't tension. think that it's necessary to be a uh, conflict all the time. Mm -hmm. So I think that there can be, um, let's say, so for example, like the image of Yahweh riding the cherub, right? So that's an image of a, of a balanced relationship between the margin and the higher aspect, you know? Mm -hmm. And you can imagine, for example, uh, moments where the stranger is a wonderful um, relationship of trade with with strangers or with other empires. Right. Yeah. So you have a you have an empire, and then you have these other empires, and and they are able to have enough peace so that the they provide potential for each other, and they mm -hmm. actually kind of increase the the possibilities of each. And so that's though there are moments like that in in history, I think, but it's uh it's difficult to kind of maintain that. You know, and then things tend to get pulled a little bit on one side too much, and then they yeah. then they move to the other, and then you get this you know, going, you get yeah. the pendulum, and before you know it, you have war. Right. right. Um, as as for war, um, I haven't done a Dune video because I was really expecting that you would do it. <laughs> I don't have a COVID into... passport, so I haven't seen it. Oh man! So I did I did the very illegal thing in Poland, because I, I, I live in Austria and I'm in Austria right, right now, but <clears throat> I went to Poland to the cinema <laughs> where it's allowed to go to the cinema and so to it there. Nice. Oh man, so okay. So that's why you haven't you haven't watched anything, right? I know some people have some people have said that you should just download it, get it, yeah. you know, get a torrent or something, download it. But ah like I, I'm not I'm patient. And it's not like I'm so I'll watch it as soon as it comes out here. It's streaming. I'll just get it and watch with my family. Okay, but but movie the movie is one thing, but you know the story, right? You you've read the books or, or I know the basic you, story. Yeah, the basic story. I, I tried reading Dune several times, but mm -hmm. man, I don't. I really don't enjoy it, and I never finished. I read like some of the later books when I was younger, but then I tried mm -hmm. reading the first book again just two years ago, I guess. But man, yeah, I just didn't like I just didn't I found sure. the the writing to be a, to be too like really heavy and and very winded long winded I would say yeah, yeah. well Tolkien didn't like it either so you're in the same yeah. team <laughs> I mean the, the the main question I I'd have about about Dune is is whether it is the the return of the king story or the barbarians at the gates like when when Paul gets the Fremen to take over Iraqis again is this and and I don't know how to how to interpret that because like with each book with each next volume you, you like the, the story develops and it's never finished so <laughs> yeah so the consequences of that act of that one action are spread spread across millennia right so you want to know if if it's the if it's the return of the king or the invasion of the barbarians right that's, that's right. A, that's yeah. your question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is gonna, it's gonna not, this is not gonna be particularly uh it's giving an answer that might frustrate people, is that that really depends on the point of view. Right. Right. That's what that's this that's the thing. So think about um that's the post think about thing. the story of King David. <laughs> like King David is a great example, right? So King David associates himself with a bunch of thieves and thugs. Mm -hmm. and like lives as an outlaw in caves you know and so when he becomes king mm -hmm. from the point of view of king saul yeah right it's definitely not great you know but for sure from the point of view of of, of david then it's the arrival of the hidden king it's the arrival right. of the true hidden king yeah. and so it's not, it's sometimes it stories can have multiple, uh, can be, so the pattern is true. Right. So the pattern of the invasion of the barbarians is true. I'm not being a postmodern and saying it's all mush and it's all, it's all, uh, it's all whatever you want it to be. It's like the pattern of the return of the king or the hidden king, the secret king manifesting himself is true. The pattern of the invasion of the barbarians is true. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes one can be the other pattern from a different perspective. Um, and so 
So, but there's also like, you could say that um, you can also have things like uh, patterns of like the, let's say the king wielding old potential, like, like something which was forgotten or something which had lost, you know. Um, so, and a good example is, so is, is Moses leaving Egypt, right? Is it Egypt falling into chaos and losing control of its hierarchy? Or is it the establishment of a new identity and uh, and a uh, you know it's both at the same yeah, that's, time? That's exactly what I struggle with each time yeah. I see a movie now. <laughs> Try to make something. But that's out of great, it. dude. If you can, if you're able to perceive the patterns from the different perspectives, then you're you're you can come very you can come a lot closer to, to insanity. Yeah. <laughs> no, not well. If you're careful, you can mostly understand that understand that let's say meaning is everywhere right that 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 the the patterns are there and in their in their complexity and their multiplicity mm -hmm. and it, if you were able to see that in a movie then when you go back in scripture like i said you'll have a much deeper understanding of what's going on there because you're able to see like for example Mathieu was was really good at this and and then i tried to kind of follow in his example he would always try to say okay so let's read the story from the point of view of the egyptians in the text like not not yes. not trying to 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 uh or for example think of a, a, a proverb where it says if you do this this will happen mm -hmm. you know and the the first reading is that this is negative yeah. but then asking yourself is there a moment where i would want this to happen yeah. yes right oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. are there stories in the bible that manifest that this relationship of causality in a positive way, even though usually we think it's a negative, you know? So if right. we want you to do that, then you can, then the story of Samson opens up to you. And a lot of the stories in the book of Judges that people have no idea what they're about will kind of open yeah. up to you. Okay. Um, so, so, so for sure. It, so, I mean, I, I would say, yeah, I always be careful not to go crazy, but, but think that it's a, it's a good, it's a good, it's a good tool to, uh, to, 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 it's a good mental exercise to do that. It's like the, the stumbling stone that destroys the hierarchies. It's not necessarily <laughs> like the, <laughs> the thing that, that is bad, but- Not necessarily, exactly. So a good, yeah. yeah. So the example in the, the, the vision of Daniel, mm -hmm. right? In the story of the, in the vision of Daniel, then you see how the, the uncut stone, which comes from the mountain, yeah. crushes the feet of the, of the hierarchy. Yeah. Yeah. And then it comes tumbling down. The description of the hierarchy is pristine. Yeah. It's the best, one of the best descriptions of hierarchy that exists in scripture is the, is the statue of Daniel. Mm -hmm. And you can apply that hierarchy to the temple. Or you can actually apply the vision of the statue of Daniel, which is an idolatrous evil hierarchy. You can yeah. apply it to the way in which, right. for example, the metals are used in the temple. Right. Right. It's the same. Yeah. Uh, but, but in that case, then the stone yeah. that comes to crush it that's right. I mean, if you can Jesus. get into that space, dude, you you're you're in a good you're in a good you're in a good <laughs> on a good road. But it's a, like you said, it's hard. And the hardest part of it is communicating it because. I mean, yeah. Like I, if you see me in a Q&A hesitating, like and going, I'm not sure I want to talk about this it's sure. because communicating the different aspects and communicating some of this subtlety and complexity is is difficult. Yeah. And I mean, I feel the danger of it because I, I really feel that, like, if I asking myself if I'm going like too far into 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 one of those interpretations that that I could like I could motivate a, a crazy interpretation of something because you know I see the patterns and it works like that like this for me and then you know <laughs> yeah well for sure you destroy the the the, the, the religion, <laughs> right? <laughs> For sure, you have to be careful and kind of pull back, you know, and then also, you know, you could see it as, um, can I say this, you, you could, you need to have a hierarchy in interpretations as well, mm -hmm. you know, and so, for example, let's say the story has a, a structure, let's right. say the scriptural story has a structure and has a main thrust that is important to maintain. And then let's say ornamentally or more marginally, then those those uh, variant interpretations are real and they're possible. Yeah. 
yeah. but they're only good if you keep them in the proper the proper order because if you don't then you get um very dangerous you get a very dangerous thing right so for example like you could say is it possible to understand the story of Cain and Abel from the perspective of Cain? And the answer mm -hmm. is, of course you can. Yeah. And doing that can actually help you understand, like I, I talked about uh, subtly, like why Christ saves Rome, why Christ mm -hmm. is Roman, is to, is to be able to perceive the story from the point of view of Cain or the point of view of Esau. Mm -hmm. But that's, if, you, if you're not careful, then you come up with... Uh, people will come up with like Luciferian interpretations of yeah. scripture because yeah. they don't right. have a normal hierarchy. Yes, they, exactly. they, they, will, they will flip it upside down. And you see right. that like a lot of the, yeah. the kind of occultist Luciferian interpretations are just them taking yeah. the pattern, flipping it upside down and saying, yeah, exactly. oh, this works. All and then yeah. wanting to kind of embody it. You have like an early Christian sex, like you had these, uh, they were called Canaanites, for example. And yeah. they were they had pr completely embodied the idea of the 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 let's say the upside down as their their story. You see that in um, you see that in also um, in in some of the the the, the weird kind of Kabbalist uh, sects, like in the Frankism and and all these kind of weird late Kabbalistic sects, where they they basically said you know it's like we'll just do the opposite of the law in order to show the totality of the patterns. Like, dude, that's yeah. not good. Like that's, that'll destroy the world. Like that will destroy the world. Uh, yeah. Well, maybe the world should be destroyed, right? <laughs> yeah, but what did, it, what did Christ say? I mean, Christ, Christ has the best, Christ always has the best answer to that. He says, all will be revealed. Yeah. You know, all the stones will be overturned. Scandal must happen, but woe to those by whom it happens. Right. It is yeah. the world, the things, so it's, it's, it's something like, uh, for example, accelerationism. So people who, Im, who want to embody accelerationist ideas, who want to bring about the end of the world, right? So there are people out there that what they want to do is they want to bring about the end of the world. So yeah. what they're doing is they want to accelerate the process. Okay. So they will embody things that they think are oh, evil, wow. right? They'll LARP, they'll LARP, they'll, they'll LARP as the their own political enemy like yeah. they'll pretend to be super woke in order to provoke the 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 hard right in order to provoke right and to to create yeah. more and more of this chaos so yeah. that world so this so that this world will end and something new will come out of it now like the thing is what people don't realize is that that plays out in you as well yeah so it's fractally true so if you do that for society don't think it won't affect you. And so you will be one of those that perishes in the right. flood that you're trying to bring about. Yes. You're not going to make it through. And so that's why Christ says things like that, where he says, you know, like we know scandal must happen. The antichrist must come. Antichrist must appear. It's all part of the pattern. Understand that it's going to happen. But that, that, that doesn't mean that you should play a part in bringing it about because it'll destroy you. <sighs> Sorry, man. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think, am I yeah. feeding your insanity now? Like, am I no, no, no. It, crazy? it all works with you know the, the 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 children of the revolution being eaten, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's all the same. It's all the same. Yeah, media, right? Exactly. It's all the same. And 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 the famous line from from the Dark Knight, like th th that some people just want to watch the world burn, and that's that's <laughs> that's what you just laid out. Um. So yeah, it's and and it seems. Um, like changing changing completely the 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 direction like with with bitcoin again you, you recently spoke to that guy and and it's the same like it seems that two patterns are 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 or or the two faces of the same pattern are are, are going on there like bitcoin is supposed to topple the the central banks right but are the central banks the, the the proper hierarchy, or are, are they the corrupt hierarchy? And and Bitcoin has this is this <laughs> people that keep using that immaculate conception of Bitcoin, <laughs> like it's the it's the savior of the monetary system or something. And how to interpret the Bitcoin? Is it is it you know one or the other, or is it both? And and yeah, you never know. No, but the thing. How can I say this? 
so the, for example like let's say the 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 decentralized idea right yeah. the idea of the decentralized blockchain and to yeah, create chaos, a completely right? decentralized uh network that is is almost automatic because it doesn't have a hierarchy yeah it's like yeah, th those things don't exist in a vacuum like mm -hmm. something like that will call to more control and more it, it was the same right. with you saw you saw it happen in the internet right the like the internet it was like oh this great thing where now all of a sudden everything is available and everybody can just say whatever they want and everybody can be anonymous and do whatever they want and people thought like it was it was basically a manifestation of like the of, of a kind of anarchic freedom and it was for a while right yeah but now look at it right right because because extremes call over. upon each other right and yeah. extremes call call to each other and so the idea that bitcoin will just be left to exist and that th that's why if you watch my com my conversation with uh actually i think it's not out yet i did a conversation with robert breedlove mm -hmm. that's going to be on his on his podcast i think okay. and um and i kept bringing it back to like guns and weapons and saying you know in the end you know, it's like this will play out the yeah. power of of like the mechanical uh, state that has weapons is okay. going to play itself out in terms of you think Bitcoin is not just going to remain online. If Bitcoin becomes a threat to the system, it's going to play itself out in the streets with with real dangerous weapons. It's not going to continue to just be online. That's a, it's a silly idea to think that that's how it's going to play out. Anyways, I think it's naive. Yeah, uh, I mean it's going to call for more control. If people want to defend Bitcoin, they will eventually have to do it in the streets, right? I mean, I don't know how it's going to happen, but I'm just saying that it's not, it's not, it's not a, it's not a simple, uh, it's not a simple just, it's not simple to think that it's just going to take down the central bank. Like I don't, and like I said, it's like the idea that that Bitcoin is secret power mm -hmm. is not necessarily something that you want either. Okay. Like do you like? It's going to reveal all these. So basically, you have you you have right now possibly massive billionaires, and yes. if Bitcoin keeps going up, maybe you'll have trillionaires. Right. Bitcoin trillionaires who are their only reason why they're trillionaires is because they own this coin. That's the only reason. They never built anything. They never done anything. They they don't yeah. they they've never managed people. They don't. They're just people who bought this coin. And so is, is that who you want to rule you? Like, I'm not saying the people that are ruling us now are doing a great job. Sure. It's horrible. And there's a yeah. lot of horrible stuff going on. But it's like, am I going to trade that for a bunch of guys that bought Bitcoin in 2011? Really? <laughs> no, thank you. Like, seriously, no, thank you. <laughs> I, I think I think there is there is some evolution in, in your ideas about governance. I, correct me if I'm wrong. Because I remember you telling us um, three, four years ago, maybe about obedience to to the authority, right? And you still keep that. But we, as when when COVID came, like you had you had expanded this <laughs> view on yeah, super super obedience. So my if you want to know my position now is that sometimes you have to disobey, and you disobey, and you accept the consequences. Mm -hmm. That's the way that I see the saints do it. It's like, if you look at the way that, um, let's say someone like St. Maximus the Confessor, for example, he just said, you're wrong. He said, he told the emperor, you're wrong, emperor. You've got it wrong. And the emperor's like, if you keep saying I'm wrong, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hurt you. And he's like, you're wrong. And so he cuts his hand off. Okay. And then St. Maximus says, you're wrong. And the emperor okay. says, if you keep saying I'm wrong, I'm going to hurt you. So he cuts his tongue out. And then St. Maximus gets sent into exile. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I'm not saying that that's easy, but I'm saying that, so St. Maximus never said, never tried to get an army, never tried to raise an army to fight the emperor. Mm -hmm. Like another like another character in the Middle Ages who, who disagreed with, uh, with his, his hierarchy, let's say. So you can see the difference between a revolutionary and someone who disagrees for the sake of the of the, the the world itself, you know. So that's what I think, but I mean, I don't know. 
when things hit the fan, like who knows what's gonna, how it's gonna, it's gonna play out because it's it's not getting better. That's for sure. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, and on this positive note. <laughs> I want to thank you very much for coming to my channel, especially in, in the in this time when it's like it seems that you have a, an interview every day somewhere and, and you're becoming very popular very quickly, especially with God's dog and and everything that is going around it that you found. Well, the thanks time. for the I really love your interpretations. And I like I remember the, the first time I saw them it was actually Mathieu who sent me your video. Yeah, I don't know how we had stumbled upon it. I and no uh, idea and we, how it happened. <laughs> yeah, and so we both we both really we really saw that you have a very uh, very strong symbolic intuition, and so if you cannot go crazy, like I think it'll <laughs> I think it'll serve us all well. <laughs> well I'll, I'll try. I'll try. I, I tried to carve out a niche with that anime and symbolism, but it seems that this this niche can be non-existent almost because like there aren't many people interested in both things at the same time. <laughs> we'll yeah, see. but I mean, I would say just, I would say to keep doing what you're doing and to 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 uh, to do it the best you can. And uh, I mean, it's sure also it, the, 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 the fact that a lot of your videos are in Polish is, is obviously limiting to their reach, let's say. So that's sure, definitely sure. going to, to happen but you know the i for sure the ones that i saw in english were really really excellent so yeah keep going yeah so thank you very much and i invite everyone to go and buy uh, and support uh, god's dog and i hope that this develops into like a multi book series and then who knows what <laughs> <laughs> thanks Jakob. i really appreciate it yeah. it's good to meet you in person finally thank you jonathan see you have a nice day all right Bye. Bye.